Hey, welcome guys. This is Motivate OTs, a channel where we look at discussing different topics in occupational therapy with the aim of inspiring occupational therapy students and occupational therapists around the world, as well as anybody else who might be interested in what we discuss here. My name is Tonga Ichichai. I'm a senior lecturer in occupational therapy. And today I'm very, very pleased to be joined by Dr. Frank Cronenberg. Uh, Dr. Frank Cronenberg is uh, joining me in this discussion uh, all the way from South Africa, Cape Town. Most of you, this name is not a new name in occupational therapy and occupational science. Uh, Dr. Frank Cronenberg has written widely uh, in, in occupational therapy topics. Um, some of you, you might uh, already be aware of uh, the publication that is called Occupational Therapy Without Borders. It is a popular publication. If you haven't seen that, please go and look for, for that book because uh, it really helps us understand um, what is it that we can do as occupational therapists or what the occupational therapy profession can offer to humanity. Um, he has also um, uh, been invited as an international speaker or international lecturer in many countries, um, including Chile, the Netherlands, the US, the United Kingdom, and of course in South Africa. And I've also been privileged to um, listen to um, some of his uh, talks. I've also been privileged to read um, some of his um, some of his publications. Uh, Frank is also the chairman of a fantastic organization called Grandmothers Against Poverty and AIDS, GAPA. If you go to www.gapa.org.za, you will find some fantastic things happening there. Uh, apart from that, he is also the co-founder and director of uh, um, the Fed of Black Works, um, another interesting uh, initiative which uh, actually links very well with uh, our discussions for, for, for today. Um, some of you, um, you might have uh, uh, heard or read about um, occupational apartheid. And I'm pleased to let you know that that concept or that term was actually introduced by Frank. And it has really made waves um, across the world. And with the changes that we've been seeing, um, topics about uh, systematic racism, um, that term or that concept really relates to that. And interestingly, all these changes that we are seeing in the world that we live in, by the time when it was coined, they were actually not happening. So that's something that's very, very, um, very, very interesting. Um, without wasting much time, Frank, <laughs> I, I would want to thank you so much for making time. I know you are very busy. Thank you so much for making time for this. And I want you to um, uh, to introduce yourself in your own words. I, I know Frank is, is not a man of few words, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to, to introduce yourself in your own words. Okay. Well, firstly, Tonga, you have to allow me to, to thank you uh, for um, inviting me and hosting me in, um, on your platform. And obviously, by extension, to anybody who tunes in uh, to your channel. And, and listens to our conversation of today. And um, I wish to add to that as well, is that I'm uh, very, very uh, pleased or excited about what may actually constitute the silver lining um, of the pandemic years that we are now uh, living through, that since 2020, there's been almost like literally an explosion of OT podcasts, you know, yeah. or OT yeah. YouTube channels. Yes, and and pretty much most of them are started by what I want to respectfully call the next generation, you know, or next generations of, of occupational therapists, um, the, and most of them actually are started by those who do not look like the majority demographic of yeah. our profession, <laughs> you know, and and I mean I think that's extremely encouraging and um, and exciting. So, so to be allowed to just, you know, occupy a, um, one of your talks here uh, in the conversation, um, really, thank you. Thank you for in inviting me. Great, great. Thanks. So an in, in introduction, uh, there'll have to be a short introduction. Uh, well, Frank Cronenberg is, um, is the name that I was given by my parents. Um, I'm originally from the Netherlands, but since 2005, uh, regards Cape Town, South Africa, home. 
you know, and that is mainly due because we established a family in this place. And family here means also one, our colleague, you know, but uh, the person to whom I am a husband today is Professor Elevani Ramugondo. Yeah. And we have now two teenage age uh, uh, daughters and uh, the four of us have made, you know, have consciously decided to make Cape Town, South Africa home. Yeah. And um, so just to make, to keep it short, you know, the introduction, I wish to share with you that after the first three years of working in Cape Town, in a township community called Luandle, which is about 50 kilometers away from Cape Town, uh, young Kosa uh, um, community members there who I had worked with, from one day to the next, they told me, you know, from tomorrow onward, we're not long going to call you Frank anymore. I says, why is that? No, no, we're going to call you Nyaniso. And I thought, hmm, Nyaniso, that, that sounds interesting. And yeah. I thought, what does it mean? They said, Nyaniso means the one who speaks his mind from the heart. Exactly, exactly. And, and they said, <laughs> the reason why we give you that name is because over the past three years, we have consistently experienced you and appreciated you in that manner. Wow. You know? And I thought, like, and then they added, no pressure. <laughs> they added, they said that if in our cultural context and traditions, someone is given a name for the right reason, that name, the meaning of that name may constitute the purpose of that person's life. Okay. Okay. You know? So I then translated it back to like, well, how does that then resonate with my name, my original name, Frank? And it is like, well, frankly speaking, or, <laughs> or Frank talk. Yeah, then resonates quite well with how people outside South Africa um, have experienced me. But also, I think my my role and contribution to um, in occupational therapy, my intentions within occupational therapy, can be captured in three terms, three related terms. Mm -hmm. and that is to disrupt, right, to generate or regenerate, mm -hmm. and to theorize those disruptions and regenerations. You know. And then to, to, to just round that off, it's like, well, to, to disrupt what? Well, to disrupt, in a way, the dominant discourse yeah. and practices of occupational therapy, you know, right. in terms of identifying what ain't right, you know, since the beginnings of our profession, but not just to critique it, but to also say, like, well, what could be it be replaced by? So to, to generate alongside others always, of course, yeah. alternatives, and the theorization then is to help yeah. us make sense yes. of those disruptions and regenerations. Wow. Wow. That, that, that's a mouthful. <laughs> it is a mouthful. I, I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for, for that, for that, Frank. Um, now let's just dive into this. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, pose my, my first question mm. and then we, we, we then take it from there. Mm. So Frank, you, you have, uh, you have written, um, and discussed a lot about historicizing uh, the politicization of occupation and systematic oppressive power dynamics mm. uh, in our understanding of human occupation. Mm. What, what exactly do you mean by these things? What, what, are the, what are the challenges? What is it that you have unearthed? What is it that you want to run with concerning all this? That's a very complex, multi-layered uh, and loaded, you know, to some extent controversial question that you're asking now. And, and I acknowledge that the space that we have to, um, to engage with that question, uh, it will be very difficult to do full justice to it. So the best we can do is starting a conversation yeah. about this complex question and then see where that takes us. Now, I, I, I think it is important um, and useful uh, when questions are asked and we engage with them is to identify what are the key words in the question that is asked and to first establish some level of clarity about what do these big terms that you just made reference to, what do you mean by them? You know, yeah. Recognizing that terminologies and concepts can always be understood in different ways, mm -hmm. but I think in order to establish a meaningful dialogue and discussion and debate about it, is for every individual who takes part in it to kind of say, how do you understand it? Yeah. Because then you establish a baseline for meaningful interaction, right? 
So let's go to those first big words that you made reference to, and that is historicizing. Yeah. And I think the word political Polit was also politicizing. Mentioned. Politicizing in relation to understanding human occupation. Yes. And of course, in its relationship with health, because that's what occupational therapy is about. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's start. I want to foreground the notion of political in this sense, because political um, is a topic you know, and a word that many people actually rather run away from <laughs> than yeah. come closer to, because of the dominant understanding of political as big P political, government, right. laws, yeah. political parties, you know, elections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And obviously that is a, an, an important aspect of it, but here I wish us to appreciate political in the sense that Aristotle, mm -hmm. back in the yeah. days, <laughs> yeah. defined it, you know? Aristotle apparently was asked, um, Aristotle, what does being political mean? And apparently he responded to it, he said, being political means being concerned mm -hmm. about what is good and bad for man. And man was written large, you know? So man as in mankind, not men as in yeah. males. Yeah. So when I first came across that definition, I said, hmm, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Because from that point onward, it was no longer possible for me to understand being a health professional as non-political. Right. So in other words, understanding and advancing health and well-being is political through this definition. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so clear. All right. So, political we've got established. Now let's move to historicized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Historicized refers to, in our commitment to understand human occupation in its relationship to health. Right. Understanding, generating understandings, knowledge about how to advance that. Historicizing means looking, taking a long view of history of human history. Yeah which allows us to start to identify and to recognize patterns, patterns of behavior, societal behavior, humanity's behavior, and problems in that behavior that keep repeating themselves. So by doing that, you start to recognize that um, the foundation, the philosophical foundation of our profession, let's, let's use Mary Riley's um, uh, classic 1961 Eleanor Clark Slager phrase. Yeah. Man, through the use of his hands, yeah. as they are energized by mind and will, can influence the state of his own health, right? Everybody yeah. makes reference to it. All over the world, they say like, yeah, that's what OT is about. That reference to man in how we treat it in occupational therapy is treated apolitically and ahistorically. Okay. What do I mean by that? By that, I mean that it seems to be that we regard within our thinking in occupational therapy that man is a given. Being human is a given for all. All humans are born equal in dignity and rights as the International, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights yeah. says, right? But historically, if we were to historicize that, then there is so much evidence that shows us that no, that's not the world that we live in. <laughs> and it hasn't been for centuries. You know, yeah. some people are regarded as more human than others and as a consequence have access to resources and opportunities mm -hmm. to sustain and live their lives, whereas others are deprived of that. Yeah. And it's based on that false uh, uh, notion, you know, and basically this is where racism comes in. Right. And, and patriarchy and classicism and sexism and all these other oppressive forces. So... Yeah. The fact that in 2020, when Black Lives Matter exploded globally during the pandemic, when people were not even allowed to go out into the streets, but people took to the streets yeah. in hundreds of thousands, although uh -huh. it was prohibited because of the pandemic, right? Yeah. This was in 2020, the first time since the origins of our profession, uh -huh. 1917 in the US, that the profession recognized that racism exists Right. That it is harmful mm -hmm. and that it is systemic. Yeah. But it means that for 103 years, up to 2020, if you go and look at the literature, racism and racist, those two terms, they are not in there at all. Mm -hmm. None of our models, none of our frames of references, none of our position statements, none of our 
you know, our curriculum was pretty much devoid of it. So how yeah. is it possible that for 103 years we were silent? It is because we never historicized yeah. and politically uh, uh, understood human occupation in relation to health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, how is that possible? If I may, if I may add to that, Tungai, why? Yeah. How is it possible that for 103 years we ignored that aspect of human history until the present? And my my suggestion here is, and it will probably sound controversial, but so be it, is that those of us within the profession since 1917, who dominantly shaped and decided what OT is and with whom OT is to work and how, mostly they look like me. Yeah, you, you are right. You are right. And that's that's the reason why people like myself are now standing up. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay, so so let, let's, let's, let's unpick this a little bit um, within the profession. Hmm. I mean, you've, you've articulated the, the, this very well, historicizing, politicizing. Now, within the profession, what, what would you call the skeletons in the closet? I think those skeletons, uh, skeletons are white, eh? no matter <laughs> no matter what the bodies look like, but skeletons all end up being white, you know. Um, in 2020, the World Federation of Occupational Therapists came out with a so-called, I think what was called the Human Resources Project. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that one. And, and so you can look at, the, they, 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 they uh, gather data, and did an analysis of data to find out like, well, okay, OTs out there in the world, how many of us are there, you know, registered practitioners, what do the demographics look like, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we are currently rapidly approaching 600,000 registered occupational therapists all over the world, you know, but they're very unequally distributed amongst now more than 100 countries. The US has most of them, followed by Japan, then Germany, then the UK, and the rest kind of has the rest of it, right? Yeah. But data that were not generated, but in a way ought to be generated, although it may be a little bit difficult, is to more about the, gem the demographic makeup. You know, we know that almost 90% of OTs worldwide are female. Yeah. So in a way, the binary gender box is ticked, you know, mm -hmm. although it's just binary. Yeah. We can also yeah. make that broader. But in terms of racial and religious and languages yeah. and, and, and those data are not gathered. But I think it is fair to say that once these data are gathered, that the very large majority of occupational therapists in the world is white. Yeah. Yeah. This is not a critique of the individuals who are white. Yeah. But I think it is important for us to acknowledge this and to evidence this, that the reason possibly why the full potential of occupational therapy after more than 100 years has still not been tapped into may mm -hmm. actually be related to the fact that one particular demographic mm -hmm. has, has dominated the thinking Mm -hmm. and, 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 the, and the shaping and the deciding on what occupational therapy is. So when you talk about skeletons in the closet, to some extent, this is part of the skeletons. You know? It is the, the resistance to acknowledging that occupational therapy, as we know it, the dominant version of it, is very monoculturally shaped. Yeah, yeah. yeah? And it is not enough to just launch diversity, equity, and inclusion campaigns yeah. And to say like, okay, let's just diversify the optics of who sits in the room and decides what occupational therapy is. There's to more be. to that. Tongai, um, you know, back to that, that question about skeletons in our closet, right? Our institutional yeah. closet. We're not talking about society. Yeah? Right. Let's first get our own house in order before immediately let's jumping out and saying, hey, we must go <laughs> and fix things out there in the world. Let's first fix our own house, right? Yeah. And acknowledge what is wrong in our own house. Yeah. And um, skeletons in our institutional closet. And I believe, you know, I touched on the, the uh, acknowledging that the full potential of occupational therapy we exists more than 100 years, if you use yes. the American origins, 1917, as a starting point. Yes. And even in the United States, where we have the longest history, occupational therapy, what it is and what it can contribute and what its potential is continues to be not clear and not obvious, right? And one, I, I would like to link this skeletons in our institutional closets to this issue of 
why do we continue to struggle with communicating compellingly yeah. to the world, wherever we find ourselves, what occupational therapy is and what its contribution is to be. Now, I want to po pose, you know, opposite, you know, suggest mm -hmm. that the lack of diversity in those first 100 years, so the dominant narrative of occupational therapy, I'm just going to call it, for argument's sake, it's a, it's a white narrative. Right. Yeah? It's a whiteness, that's a bigger term, a whiteness-based, a whiteness-entrenched narrative. Hmm. That is not to say that there's nothing in it that is of value. Obviously, there is a lot of value in it, but value to whom and for whom? Who is benefiting from it? Those yeah. are the kind of questions. This is where the political comes in, right? Who's yeah. benefiting? You know, who's the, who are the decision making? So I believe that by addressing, by not shying away from asking why questions, not just one, but to keep pushing that why question. Why? But why? But why? But why? You know, because we need to get to the bottom of this. If we want to get to, to tap into the full potential of occupational therapy as an idea, we need to get to the bottom of what may stop us from getting there. Yeah, and for that you have to historicize, right? Yeah, I get it, right? Political yeah. historicize. Yes, yeah. yeah, clear. Having acknowledged this oppressive forces over centuries, you know, where we have to acknowledge that being human is not a given, but it is a potential that is to be enacted. Right. And our potential can be enacted in ways that negate our humanity and as a consequence causes harm to human relations. But it can also be enacted in ways that affirms our humanity, the best of our potential, yeah. and as a consequence generates health. You know, it's health promoting. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that that gives us a framework through which to approach this question that you have asked. Now, allow me to park that for a second and to say, like, well, go back to potential of OT. Yeah. As I <clears throat> was educated to become an OT later in life, because I was in my thirties already in the Netherlands, I, I studied that in my undergrad there. At some point in the third year of the four-year program, I was very close to pull the plug and say, like, well, no, occupational therapy, after all, is not, is not for me. I'm in, the, I'm in the wrong place here. Yeah, because there, I, there are a number of people who, who, who can actually identify with that. That's why I mention it. That's why I mention it. So it was, I was very close to getting out you know, because I entered because after having worked as a volunteer with so-called street children and gangs in mm -hmm. Mexico, that's where I realized that I want to go back to school, that my original education background, you know, being a, a primary school teacher, mm -hmm. didn't prepare me enough to work with that particular population. Right. So I ended up choosing occupational therapy then. That was going to have to need to be the field through which I could meaningfully contribute to that particular phenomenon, right? So doing, you know, that, that kind of um, 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 alerted me to, so when I thought like, well, in the Netherlands, when nobody was teaching us, of course, about working with that population, I thought, no, I'm in, a, in the wrong place. And then I saw a documentary film mm -hmm. called Mao to Mozart. Mao to Mozart. So Mao referring to Mao Zedong, right? The former right. chairman, yeah. Yeah. communist China, mm -hmm. cultural revolution, and Mozart, the classical composer, right? And I watched that documentary film, it was in 1980, it came out. So just when China was opening its borders to allow what they called capitalism with a human face into China. Mm -hmm. uh, and the minister of culture of China at that point acknowledged that the East and the West didn't get along for many decades, the Cold mm -hmm. War, right? Communism, capitalism. And he says, how can we start to build bridges between two parts of the world that didn't get along? Yeah. And he says, I think a good start would be by bringing people together who speak the same language. And by same language, he didn't mean, uh, let's say, Western people who speak Chinese and Chinese people who speak English. Yeah. He said the arts, music. Right. right. So he invited Isaac Stern, a great late violinist, over to come give master classes at, at theaters all over China. And at some point, they, 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 they have had, uh, put forward like a very young Chinese girl who was playing a very difficult piece, you know, in front of mm -hmm. the maestro, yeah? And everybody yeah. was clapping because it was beautiful. Um, yeah. But then Isaac Stern turned around and says, he says, although that was technically brilliant, what you just showed here, that's not music, that's not Mozart. 
and then they went like, oh, but how she played every right note, you know, and she played it in the right speed. How can that not be music? Yeah. So they asked the question, the important question, what is music all about? And then Isaac Stern responded first in words and then on his violin. He said, what is music all about? The instrument is not that important. It is only a means to an end. In other words, you don't use music to play the violin. You use the violin to play music. Yeah, yeah. And watching that and then seeing him play on the violin, you know, acting on the words, that's when the penny dropped. And when I said that I should stay with an occupational therapy mm -hmm. and not throw the towel. Because from that moment on until today, I distinguish between the idea of occupational therapy yeah. and the profession of occupational therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in other words, the idea of occupational therapy to me is the music. Right. And the instrument is the profession. Yeah. So if we over identify with and make with the instrument, in other words, make the profession more important than the music, yeah. we, no, we, an we will never tap into its potential. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, that's, uh, if I can just jump in with a, with a follow-up question there. Mm -hmm. You have, you have uh, mentioned that uh, occupational therapy has this huge potential. Mm -hmm. Of course, you've talked about the demographics and the whiteness within the profession. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the profession itself or the idea itself, as you've just put it, it has got something to offer for humanity, not yes. only for specific races. So how exactly. can we, in this day and age, how can we tap into this potential? We can tap into this potential by um, those who, until the present day, are dominantly the gatekeepers, the decision makers, to step back, step down from and welcome in, you know, like pretty much make space for those who historically we've not allowed to occupy those seats and to guide us into, into, into paths, into journeys, into roads towards stepping yeah, into the yeah. potential to take well, charge. While you are there, uh, Frank, so sorry about that. You know, I, I know your, your views can be really controversial and so are mine at times. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you said you're looking for them to invite or to welcome. It's, to me, is, is, is that the right approach? Because if, if you are being invited, you are being invited to, to whose table? I, I changed the wording as I was thinking out loud. I right. changed the wording to making space for. It's almost like if I want to be more blunt, I would say like, well, to get out, <laughs> you know, to get out, take a back seat, to take a back seat, you know, to take a back seat. Okay. And, and that is not to say, and it is very often misinterpreted and say, like, well, oh, so are you saying that we have no role to play anymore or we have no contribution to make anymore? That's not what I'm saying. But I think that the future of occupational therapy, the, 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 the chances of us tapping into the full potential of the idea of occupational therapy, mm -hmm. I, think, I think we can only get there. I believe that. I think we can only get there if we let those who have intergenerationally experienced having been treated as less than human mm -hmm. take the lead. Right. Little Rani would last week. She, Little Rani did a talk, and she um, she she made a case for uh, in in a, in a talk called "Theorizing Present Struggle," and she right. said that is to be black led. And black here was not referring to a complexion, but it was, a, in a way, a, a metaphor to refer to those mm -hmm. populations. Mm -hmm. Because it's not about individual level, it's at population level. Population, yeah. Intergenerationally have experienced dehumanization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? But they are still here. They have survived that. So if they tap into what that experience is like to be treated as less than, mm -hmm. and they know from lived experience intergenerationally what harm is done by that kind of treatment. Wow, that's, that's, that's profound, Frank. Uh, that's profound. Uh, I, I know you've touched a little bit on what, my other question about um, how you see the future of OT and what is it that uh, we can be doing. 
um, if you can just maybe in a few words sort of like consolidate this discussion to, to just say this is how you're seeing the uh, future of the OT profession. Is it a future that you want to see? If not, what sort of future would you want to see and how can we get there? I know you've already touched a bit on some, some of the you can use to get there. Uh, it, I, I just want to put in a disclaimer that we are not, I am not doing justice to uh, the nuances you know, mm -hmm. and, the, and the layeredness of these complex questions, you know, in this in this very brief uh, uh, um, conversation that we are having, right? So I do not, I do not claim to have answered your questions uh, okay. uh, uh, properly, but I think as a trigger for further dialogue, discussion, and debate, I think that this 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 hopefully serves a purpose. So I believe, and as I have proposed as well, alongside others, is that a historization and politization of our main concern in mm -hmm. occupational therapy, is to, to not exclusively focus on how individual clients, those who currently have access to our services, mm -hmm. are doing, are functioning in their everyday social context, at home, at work, at school, in the larger society, because that's mm -hmm. the dominant concern of the, the occupational therapy that we know and that we are trained for. But by making it political, mm -hmm. the question becomes... Not how are you as an individual, but how are we and the largest identity we that we I, that I propose we can think about is humanity as a whole, all yeah. human beings, a billion of us, yeah. doing, not in terms of functioning, but mm -hmm. living together yeah. as local and global communities and societies. Wow. The main aspect of that shift of concern mm -hmm is that the focus is not on individuals, but it's on relationships. It's about relationships between individuals in the, and groupings of individuals who together are to make up mm -hmm. our local communities and societies. Mm -hmm. It's a huge shift. It's conceptually and theoretically definitely a possible shift, but I believe that the future will focus more on relationships. And in a way, the Ubuntu, the African ethic and philosophy of Ubuntu, yeah. I am because we are, you know, is radically relational. And I think that that's where, through that approach, I think the chances of future generations, you know, us doing the work today, future generations are more likely to tap into the full potential of the idea, the music, of occupational therapy. Wow, wow. Uh, Tungai, I really think that the idea of occupational therapy is too radical, too powerful to be contained by a profession. Wow, wow, wow. That's that's powerful, that's profound. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, I, I wouldn't let you go without talking a little bit about, uh, about GAPA. Can you just briefly talk about GAPA and to some, I, I know there is, uh, there's always a link with human occupation. Mm -hmm. Bring in some links in there with the work that you're doing with, uh, with GAPA? Well, GAPA, GAPA stands for Grandmothers Against Poverty and AIDS, as you mentioned. It's, a, it's an NGO or an NPO, a nonprofit organization, um, which was founded in all the way back in 2001, 2001, 2002, by, and now you must pay very close attention to what I'm saying, <laughs> it was founded by 10 grandmothers and an occupational therapist. And because this is significant, I repeat it. It was founded by 10 grandmothers and an occupational therapist. I did not say by an OT and 10 grandmothers. Yes. <laughs> it's very significant because yeah, we tend it. to be educated into always foregrounding the profession. Mm -hmm. Yet we talk about being client-centered, but it's always mostly about us and not about those who, in a way, are to yeah. welcome us. Yeah. Yeah. To accompany them on their journeys on their journey. of life, you know, and, and in addressing their plight. Right? Yeah, because that's how it started, yeah. right? So, so the organization started because, um, the, well, HIV AIDS, as you know, and as people know all over the world, uh, South Africa was one of the countries that was hardest hit, you know, mm -hmm. so we're talking now early to 2000s. ARVs were around, you know, as, 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 as medication, but the, the, many the grannies had lost many of their children mm -hmm. and were now the primary caregivers of 
grandchildren who were left behind yeah. uh, by children who they had lost, and some of them also HIV positive. So there were no organizations that were actually looking after those kids then. It was the grandmothers. As you know, probably as yeah. in Zimbabwe, it's the yes. grannies that just absorb yes. that plight. But in the meantime, they're also grannies. They have to live off very uh, meager uh, pensions, you know, old age pensions. They have yeah, their old age. pension at all. <laughs> exactly. No, exa exactly. Very, very right. Um, so they actually had to carry everything. They had to carry their communities. Mm -hmm. know, and silently so. You know, and very often individually so. So pretty much where, when GAPA was founded, there was a, this, this OT enabled the grannies, first of all, a space for them to come together and to share from their lives. Their lived share experience. means others were listening as to what they were going through. And yeah. each and every one of them of those 10 had a chance to speak. And in the end, they found out that they were not alone, mm -hmm. that people listened, they yeah. cried together, mm -hmm. they shared tissues together, they mm -hmm. prayed together, yeah. they got up and danced and sang together so that their dignity and their resilience, you know, was intact. And then they started to say like, okay, how are we going to tackle our issues for every day, but not alone, but together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The OT basically enabled them to be researchers of their own lives and to identify their needs and prioritize them, you know, and say like, okay. And then yeah. once they had identified a need, they said, like, well, what is it that we lack? Is it knowledge? Is it skills? Mm -hmm. is, it, uh, is it resources? Mm -hmm. Most often a combination of all three of them. Yeah. And then it was about bringing people in to train them, to educate them, things that they were deprived of during apartheid. Mm -hmm. So, and that knowledge and those skills, they then transferred to other grants. Wow. Wow. Right. Yeah. So, so all of this was done, not one-on-one. -on -one, it was collective. It's a collective occupation. Collective occupation. Yeah. It's about relationships. Mm -hmm. yeah? It is the together we are stronger, not as a motto, as a slogan, but embodied, you know, doing yeah. together. Yeah. Do it in order to bring about doing well together, Ubuntu. Exactly, exactly. In China, we call it Ubuntu. Exactly, exactly. Same principle, right? Same yeah, it's roots. exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if you think about it, Tongai, being human, mm -hmm. we cannot do that by ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. You, we become human through how we relate and interact with other humans. Mm -hmm. And if we do so in ways that negate our humanity, the best of our potential, obviously that will have consequences for our health and well-being. Yeah, yeah. But we can also do so in the opposite ways. You know, okay. so occupational therapy then becomes about creating conditions of possibility that allow us to tap together into the best of our potential. Wow, wow. Thank you so much, Frank. I know we can go on and on with this topic. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, guys, thank you so much. Uh, if you have been listening to this discussion, I've been discussing with uh, Dr. Frank Cronenberg uh, some very, very valuable nuggets um, about the idea of occupational therapy and how we can actually tap into this potential and actually uh, make the world a better place than we found it. So thank you so much, uh, Frank, for this. I, I do hope that this is not your last time uh, coming to Motivate OTs to share your thoughts and your ideas. And uh, personally, I, I get so much inspired when, when I listen to you speak, when I read uh, whatever you've written. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Tungai, for having me. And good luck with your platform here. Keep going. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, guys. Uh, bye for now. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do subscribe to the channel because there is some content that is going to only be available for those who have subscribed. So until next time, it's bye for now.